Well, hello, and thanks for tuning in to this episode of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, and we're already at episode 14. I can't believe it. I'm just flying these things off the shelf, trying to get them out there as fast as I can. And we're already on episode 14. Got a great show for you today with some different types of updates. But before I get to that, want to sh- do a quick shout out to my friends that helped organize uh, the event here in Brampton in coinciding with the National Drive Electric Week events that happened all across the U.S. and Canada over the last week or so. Uh, I believe there's over 330 events uh, across all the states and most of the provinces in Canada to celebrate uh, and educate people on EVs. And I was fortunate enough to be invited to come out to the Brampton event where we had Oh, about 25 to 30 EVs of different flavors out there on a cooler and windy day. Uh, It was a little bit different from a few days ago prior to that where we had hot, humid uh, conditions. So, hey, this is Canada. That's why we call it the Great White North. Uh, So appreciate being invited out. And thanks to Larry and the crew at uh, uh, Waterloo Region EV Association for setting this up as well. And had a great time and uh, talked to a lot of people. And I think we, we certainly changed a few minds regarding EVs and where they are. So thanks again for having me out for that. Opening story today is a study that I read from an organization called Woods McKenzie Research. They uh, are an analyst firm that focuses on the uh, oil and gas, renewable energy, the energy sector in total. And they came out with this study in the greenhouse gas emissions from a well-to-wheel perspective. And that's something that comes up in conversations quite a lot is I think we all know that driving an EV has, you know, especially a full battery, all electric only version has zero tailpipe emissions. But what about all the greenhouse gas uh, gases that are generated f- during all these other parts of the life cycle of an electric vehicle as compared to an ICE counterpart? And this study uh, came out with a conclusion and findings that EVs are up to 67% lower in emitting greenhouse gas emissions throughout the wheel-to-well life cycle basis than an ICE equivalent. Now, I had a great conversation with Amon Verma. He's one of the uh, research analysts at Wood McKenzie. And he basically told me that their analysis are unique. Uh, a lot of the data that they have is internal data that they've captured over the many years in, in, in uh, looking at energy research that they do as an organization. And they, they, looked, they looked at that data from a, a, a number of different factors and that looked at including things like how the fuel is produced in refineries and energies associated with that, where the crude oil is sourced from, uh, the mileage of cars, you know, how, of course, electricity is produced, whether it's in more cleaner environments like solar, wind and hydro or, or others that are more coal fired, as an example, and how the energy use associated with the vehicle and battery manufacturing and charging from an EV perspective. So not only looking at the energies and the greenhouse gases emitted during the manufacturing, the building of the vehicles, but also the building of the battery packs and the mining and all the sourcing that comes with that. And of course, factors differ from country to country, obviously. You know, it's interesting that even though EVs have zero tailpipe emissions, they are not really greenhouse gas emissions free. When you evaluate them on a wheel-to-well basis on that total life cycle, um, uh, Amon also mentioned to me that he agrees that about 280 million EVs will be on the road by 2040, and this is including both plug-in hybrid and full battery electric-only vehicles. And when that happens, uh, oil displacement will be uh, will reach 5.5 million barrels a day. So that's uh, when we get that number of EVs on the road, that's how much oil we're not going to be using uh, because those EVs are there. So certainly some great stats. I appreciate Amon for taking the time to talk and talk to me about the, the study. And it's very interesting. And it just, again, it gives you some more knowledge when you're going out talking to people that uh, you can have those conversations about well wheel-to-well emissions. Shift gears to Canada. Hey, my home country here where I am. Uh, it was great news for the month of August. Our sales have skyrocketed from an EV perspective. In fact, they're up 245%. That's how far they've, they've grown for the month of August. We had a record-setting month with over 4,460 plugins sold, and that's about 2.5% market share for Canada. And that's pretty significant where it's only a short time ago I was talking about uh, EVs only having about 1% market share uh, globally, but certainly in Canada as well. Two best-selling models here, the Nissan Leaf and the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid, of course, uh, is doing quite well. So Nissan sold just over 1,000 units, 1,050 for the month of August, which is one of their best months ever for the Leaf. Uh, almost 4,000 year to date. And similar numbers to the Mitsubishi Outlander selling about 837 here in Canada with about 3,900 year to date. 
Tesla Model 3 came in in the third spot, selling about 500, or that's what we, that's a guess uh, from an estimate, uh, because it's, again, it's hard to get deliveries from Tesla until they talk about the quarterly reports, and even those you might get, you might not get the granular data. But we, uh, they estimated that uh, about 300, 500, excuse me, were sold in Canada. That puts a year to date of about 3,400 of Model 3s. I expect that number to grow exponentially, and I expect the Model 3 to be the top selling uh, battery electric car or EV in Canada at the end of the year uh, as Tesla continues to roll out production of the Model 3 and orders continue to be filled here in Canada, both uh, not just in Ontario, but in other provinces as well. Toyota Prius Prime, Chevy Volt, and Ford Fusion Energy are still selling here and they round out uh, the other list of cars sold great job for uh, canadian numbers and let's hope that that type of scenarios are being replicated in other parts of the world as well now speaking of sales in europe they had a great uh, europe's doing great from an ev perspective but nissan is one of the best selling evs in europe uh, nissan sold for over forty three thousand leafs that's an astounding fact um and and i think really the neat fact a uh, bit of information regarding these sales is that nearly 70% of those who purchased a LEAF over these eight months were first-time EV owners. These were people that don't have a plug-in hybrid, that don't have a, a battery electric vehicle, that just have conventional cars today that actually went out and bought a battery electric vehicle, and in this case, a Nissan LEAF, their very first electrified vehicle. And that's an outstanding number. It's something that I've always talked about at Nissan, and, and there was a quote from one of the, their directors uh, regarding this article, and this person said, and I quote, the fact the LEAF has resonated so strongly with both motorists and critics against a backdrop of increasing EV adoption and an ever-growing list of competitors shows just how talented it is. Looking ahead, we're confident that LEAF's reputation as a leader in the EV market will continue to grow. And, you know, he can safely say that they are a leader because um, not only has the LEAF garnered multiple awards from very many European countries on on. Uh, on the model, but also uh, Nissan has delivered over 340,000 Leafs globally since its inception in 2010, and that makes it the number one uh, model for EVs in sales in the world. Um, yes, it surpasses the Model 3 and it surpasses the S and X, not combined. Tesla is pretty close now, I think, from a global sales perspective of meeting that number, uh, if not passing it by now. But from a single model, the Leaf is still the number one selling EV in the world, and people tend to forget that. Um, so I'm bringing this up because I, I do spend a little bit of time on forums, and I won't go too deep into this subject because we won't have time to end this show. But there's a lot of, still a lot of negativity towards the LEAF as a general model in forums. And, and I try to stay away from forums because of that. I don't think they're factual. Uh, you go there for advice and for some assistance, but not to hear negative. And people still slamming the LEAF as, oh, you know, they all suffer from battery degradation. They're terrible cars and yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, that's just simply not the case. If there were that many failures that people are reporting, then this, this would be world wide news and Nissan would not be selling as many Leafs as they are and having such a such a plentiful and, and, and time selling these and really, you know, penetrating that market even further. So, you know, I just want to caution people again, people that are looking at EVs don't understand a lot of the background that that myself and, and I'm sure pretty well all my viewers watching this have have some knowledge in the EV environment. And I'm no scientist and I don't have all conclusive data. But you know, in general, the Leaf is a good car, like many other models. And in order to cur encourage people to look at adoption, we need to be objective in our viewpoints and not just, again, be negative about one versus the other. And this is a great, uh, this is great information just to back up the fact that I think Nissan's, you know, picked the right sweet spot. They've gone after that market of 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 users that are thinking of getting into EVs for the first time. Yes, they wanted to come out with something a little nicer, better that their that their uh, existing owners have asked for, and they've done that in the model year 2018, but they've also really seen the need for that sweet spot of, of price and value versus what you get from a battery electric vehicle range and all that performance and all that good stuff. And, and the, the Leaf really hits that sweet spot. You know, as does the Ionic to a degree, as does the eGolf, but those other models are hard to find. Um, and they suffer from production, um, just lack of production in general, right? You can get some eagles in other parts, but not necessarily much in North America. So, you know, Nissan's capitalizing on that. And, and yes, depending on what you want to uh, buy, there's all kinds of different cars. But just remember this fact. And, and this is just some information to substantiate what I've been saying all along about the new Leaf and, and where Nissan has targeted the Leaf all the time, you know, as, as a main product.
Now shifting gears to the Tesla Model 3, I just wanted to quickly bring up some information that Tesla has announced that the base Model 3, that $35,000 unicorn that we're, a lot of people are waiting for, will finally start production within the, well, about the next eight months or so. Um, now to quote Elon Musk in a recent statement, he said, quote, we will definitely offer a $35,000 version of the Model 3 and probably at the end of this year is when we will be able to make a smaller version of the battery pack and get into volume production of the $35,000 version about the end of Q1 next year, unquote. Now, however, the, the report that I uh, read stated that production will start in April or May of next year, so that coincides with about eight months from now. There was no update in the, in the article and in, in the recent news about uh, right-hand drive versions at all being available yet. I think it's still well into 2019 from my understanding. So for my friends in the UK and Australia and New Zealand and those countries waiting for right-hand drive, you're going to have to continue to wait um, because I haven't heard any firm dates on that yet. But for those waiting for that $35,000 base Model 3 from a budget pricing perspective, it's coming. It's just going to be a little bit longer. So uh, stay tuned. And if there's any more changes, I'll certainly let you know. Well, the main topic of my show today is that Audi e-tron launch that happened a couple of days ago. Now, I didn't stay up uh, till 1130 on Monday night to watch the live stream. I'm just too tired, too busy. So I watched it the next day and I have to admit it was a pretty good event. It wasn't overly long. It was uh, could have been shorter, though. It was a lot of, you know, marketing wahoo, as, as always, that these manufacturers do at these events. Uh, but getting to the point. But Audi made some good points and they gave out some good stats during the launch. Um, so hopefully if you watched it, you enjoyed it. I mean, the, the, the first version of the e-tron is a five passenger all electric SUV. Uh, interesting that they uh, have already come up with towing capacity ratings of four, up to 4,000 pounds. So that's pretty good for that. It'll come with a 95 kilowatt hour liquid cooled battery pack uh, comprised of 36 cell modules, each with 12 pouch type cells with a nominal voltage of 396 volts for those of you who like that kind of data. It'll have an, uh, it has a 9.6 kilowatt onboard charger for North America and an 11 slash 22 kilowatt phase three for Europe. Of course, it'll support DC fast charging of up to 150 kilowatts. That's great. One thing unique about the e-tron in Europe is that it has virtual mirrors, and they talked a little bit about that, and there's already video out there. You can check these things out. I don't believe that they're going to be available in North America or other markets that have more stringent uh, safety and controls regarding the side mirrors, but they're pretty cool. Check it out if you do happen to get one in Europe. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback at some point on that. Now, range on these, WLTP, they talked about uh, 400 kilometers or 248 miles. There's no EPA numbers yet, but they, they did mention during the... Uh, the, the launch that they did a mountain drive, you know, up a mountain and down a mountain. And coming back, they, they got about 175 miles with 94 miles left um, on that range. And that's very, because primarily of the very efficient, what they call recuperation or we call regenerative breaking, <laughs> regenerative energy from that. Uh, and the e-tron can get up to 30% efficiency from recuperation. So that's pretty cool. Being an Audi, of course, is going to be Quattro, and it's an all-wheel drive SUV for, uh, with offering a 0 to 60 uh, or about 100 kilometers an hour in a neck snapping 5.5 seconds. Uh, that's based on 300 kilowatt or 664 newton meters of power from the motors. And the front motor has 135 kilowatts and the rear is 165 kilowatts. Now, reservations are open. So if you've got a thousand bucks US, a thousand bucks Canadian, or maybe a thousand equivalent in your local currency, you can go ahead and reserve an e-tron. Now, they won't start deliveries into the U.S. until the second quarter of 2019. I'm assuming that they will start earlier deliveries maybe in Europe first for those, maybe in Q1 of next year. So, But you know your, your mileage will vary locally, so check that out. MSRP starts at 74,800 USD. These, again, are U.S. pricings before any incentives or tax credits. So, it certainly puts it in line with the premium uh, electric vehicles that we see manufacturers coming out with. Um, now, one cool thing about Audi, though, is that they're thinking like Tesla in this case. So they've copied Tesla. They're, you know, Not only are they building the, and bringing out their EV, but they're also bringing out some infrastructure support. And how they're doing that is two ways. Of course, Audi is part of that whole group contributing to the Electrify America charging infrastructure. They're putting about $2 billion worth of bucks into that. And by July 2019, they say that there'll be 500 fast charging sites in the U.S. in 40 states and in 17 top metro markets. 
Now, the plan is to have over 2,000 chargers across the U.S., say, within the next 5 to 10 years, and no spaced no more than 120 miles or 193 kilometers apart. They're all going to have 150 kilowatt charging capability. So again, to support the e-tron as an example. And to further support the e-tron, Audi's launched what they call the e-tron charging service card. This will be a physical card or, or and or an app on your phone, from my understanding, that will allow you to get access to over 72,000 charging points by over 220 providers with the one card. Pretty, pretty smart in them doing that. And uh, on top of that, the new U.S. e-tron owners that purchase these cards will receive 1,000 kilowatt hours of free charging for the first four years of ownership. Uh, I believe that it's 1,000 total over four years. I don't believe it's 1,000 per year, but I could be wrong there. So you'll have to check out those details on the Audi website. Uh, and again, that's going to be offered through the Electrify America infrastructures. And another smart move as well is uh, looking at the in-home charging infrastructure. And Audi did a great thing by partnering with Amazon. Yes, Amazon. So you can... Uh, Amazon will be able to provide turnkey in-home charging solutions for the Audi uh, to support the Audi vehicles. That means you can buy your home charger. They can supply a certified electrician to install it and uh, warranty it and all that good stuff. And eh, if you want Alexa integration, they'll provide that too, if you're into Alexa. So um, that's pretty cool. And I think that that's a brilliant idea from Audi to be able to partner with the likes of Amazon to make it easier for consumers to not only buy the EV, but to buy the support. Uh, most people we know charge at home. So this will be a great way for, for um, consumers to get their charging infrastructure in one easy package. So good job, Audi. I thought it was well done. Um, I, I don't think there's anything mind blowing in the launch. Uh, you know, it looks like an Audi product. It's got the premium build quality and the nice features. It looks just like uh, any of their other Q line of, of SUVs. It, I don't really see much. There's some slight cosmetic differences, but good on them. I think it'll it'll do well within the market that it's positioned. It certainly is not a mass market vehicle from a numbers because it's a pretty price pricey vehicle you're starting you know you're up there in the i pace you're up there in the model s between an s and an x kind of standpoint from functionality but you know it is an suv it'll have those those attributes there so good on audi and uh, let's uh, we'll see what happens and hopefully i'll be able to get my hands on one over the next six months or so and provide more a little bit more detailed uh, uh, information on that so good on audi i wanted to provide a quick update on a car that I featured on a show, either last show or a couple of shows ago, everything's starting to blend here, folks. So uh, like I said, I'm on episode 14 already. I can't believe it. But there was this car that you just you just want to put your arms around and hug. It's so cute. That Microlino car. Remember that thing? This is made in Italy uh, by a company, and they actually launched uh, the car uh, a couple of months ago, if I remember correctly. And they've actually got over 8,000 pre-orders now for this thing, valuing about $100 million bucks for the company. That's pretty good for this little thing. Uh, that comes out at about 12,000 euros or about $14,000 US as this little urban zippy commuter vehicle that goes runabouts uh, here and there. Now, most of the pre-orders have come so far from Germany and Switzerland, but there are others from around the world, the rest of the world. And remember, this car is street legal in Europe, and uh, the company is going to start a limited production of about 25 cars next month in October. And this is to tweak out any concerns from a build quality and perspective and just you know refining the production process and then they'll get into large scale production to beginning in December of this year so we should start seeing these cars on the road by the end of this year or early January from uh, from what I'm hearing from these guys so if you have one on order and if you get one please I'd love to see a video of it or or get an email of your 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 thoughts about this car it's pretty cool and I think it's going to do quite well for the markets that it's positioned in so a uh, good job on micro you know, and let's hope we see start seeing these out on the road soon. Now, my last story today is an event that I covered last week from a company called eCamion. I was invited to the launch of their new uh, EVSE um, program that they're providing here in Ontario and western or eastern Manitoba to provide more roadside charging infrastructure. So uh, I did a quick video on it. Uh, here it goes. Uh, check this out. All right, so I'm here at eCamion. This is a company in Toronto, and I'm with Alice Wang. You're the marketing manager, I guess, for eCamion? Yeah, I run marketing for eCamion. She's, she's, really she's really the top dog <laughs> here, but anyway. So they invited me out for the launch of their new uh, DC fast chargers from a consumer that they're going to be rolling out. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. So eCamion is planning to launch um, a network of 
fast charging and level two charging stations along the Trans-Canada Highway between Ontario and Manitoba. Uh, there's going to be 34 locations overall and the purpose of this project is to provide much needed infrastructure up north where there's not much right now. Yeah, that's great. I mean, there is a, a big lag from a coverage perspective on DC fast charging and even level two is uh, mm -hmm. lumping those in. So 34 locations covering Toronto and, uh, sorry, Ontario and into Manitoba, is that correct? That's correct. Excellent. And from a time frame perspective, I understand from speaking today that you're, you're going to roll out about three this year and then the majority next year? Yeah, we have three currently in development right now and we're planning on getting them out by November of this year and then the rest of them into the next year. And these are going to be uh, predominantly DC fast charging at 50 kilowatts and I understand they're going to be a combination of CCS and Chatamo? Yes, they'll support both standards. Right, and you'll have, uh, from a payment mechanism, I asked about that and I, I was told that Initially, you're going to have your own, uh, formulate your own POS system, so whether it's a you know, card tap based system or something like that. But I, I believe the start, you may not be charging anything, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, Natural Resources Canada, um, who is partially funding us for this project, really just wants there to be the infrastructure to cover those areas and um, make it more of a welcoming place for people with EVs to drive their vehicles up there and have that coverage. So that's really our goal going forward with the project. Excellent. Well, I mean, you heard it here first, uh, folks. Free charging, you know, especially level uh, three. Where can you get that? Tell me. Um, so that'll be great to check these things out. Uh, please check out their website and, and follow the progress of the installation of these uh, chargers throughout uh, northern Ontario and into Manitoba. Now, beyond the consumer-based um, stuff that we've seen here today, what else do you guys do? Yeah, so eCamion uh, is traditionally an energy storage company. We do lithium-ion batteries, and we have our um, energy storage stations um, across Toronto and the rest of Canada. Um, another EV related project that we're doing right now is um, supplying chargers for urban high rises and other um, buildings that don't have the necessary electrical infrastructure to support charging. Which is great. Yeah, the other gentleman was t telling us a little bit about some initiatives they got going there. And we all know that, you know, condo charging is, is an issue because more people in condos want to get into EVs and they're, the challenge is finding stations. So it's great that you guys are involved there. Thank you very much for having me out to cover you guys and, and I wish you all the best on your launch and success in the organization. I'll definitely be trying out some free charging. I'll tell you that next, uh, next spring when I john off to northern Ontario and uh, look forward to uh, your progress. Thank you so much, Kenneth. All right. Thank you. Well, hope you enjoyed that video. And again, my thanks to eCamion for inviting me out. It was a great time. It was nice to meet the women of WIRE. And WIRE is a group of women. It's called Women in Renewable Energy. And these are these are ladies that are involved either directly by working for energy co companies or companies involved in the energy sector, or they're doing research or, or they're doing analytical work in that type of environments. And this is a pretty cool group uh, of women that, that meet on a regular basis, that have speed mentoring classes, that uh, do tours and do uh, road trips and outings regarding uh, organizations and going to see things in the energy sector. So if you're interested in learning more about WIRE, go just Google them and check out their website. They're here in Ontario uh, in Canada, I believe, but I don't know if they have other chapters in other countries, but you can certainly check them out. And if you're interested in joining them, certainly do that. But great to meet all those uh, lovely ladies. And I had some great conversations. And I learned a lot about what's going on in some of the other areas in the energy sector. So thank you for sharing information. And again, thank you for eCamion for inviting me to that event. So that's it. I've hit the end of the show already. Wow, time flies fast. Uh, you know, I love to hear from you. So please uh, don't hesitate to send me an email at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. Of course, you can get me there. Hey, if you want to send me a video of something, uh, you got a question you want to ask for a mailbag, um, you can audio it. Uh, if you want to tape an audio and just send it to me, I'll play that and play the video on air if you want, or just simply write something down. Please, I'd love to hear from you. You can also follow me and comment on Twitter at EVRevShow. It's a Twitter handle. I'd love it if you subscribe to this YouTube channel, and you can do that just by clicking the subscribe button. And don't forget, click that bell icon as well, because that way you'll be notified when I send shows up to the channel. You'll get instant notification of that. I'll, I'm also continuing to do audio podcasts, and I have a few already available through, of course, the YouTube channel and iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn Radio. So just search EV Revolution on those uh, mediums to find my audio podcast and I am working on the next audio podcast within the next week or so. I've got some overseas traveling coming up and I'm going to try to tie something in that to that so stay tuned for that. And oh, I of course I want a, a big shout out to my Patreon supporters uh, on the Patreon campaign. Thank you very much again for supporting me even a dollar a month. Everything 
uh, everything helps. Um, there's more traveling I'm going to be doing. There's a lot more things that I have planned in the bucket over the next uh, six months to a year to continue to bring you some quality stuff here on this channel. And I'd love it if you are thinking about supporting me that you can do so by checking out www.patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show. And that's it. That's all I have for today. So again, thank you very much for tuning in. I'll be working on my next show. I'll be going to JAG Canada next week uh, for an invitation for the media event for the IPA. So I'll get a little bit more hands-on stuff there. And I'll have that on my next show and other stories going on around the EV world. So until then, stay safe and thank you very much for watching. All the best. Mm -hmm.